new LU. I'm Daisy. And I'm Caroline. And today and tomorrow, our men's D1 hockey team is going up against Maryville. And today is Pink the Rink for Breast Cancer Awareness, so be sure to get there early to get some free thunder stick. And tomorrow is Canada Day, so you could come early and have a chance to get a free beanie. Make sure you get your tickets early, and if you can't be there in person, then check out the live stream on the Liberty Flames website. New Coffee House audition dates have just been added. They will be the 23rd and the 24th from 4 to 10 p.m. We are so excited to see you guys perform, and if you still want to audition, there might be a spot left for you. Tomorrow night is big screen movie night right here in Vines at 7 p.m. Yes, grab a friend and some popcorn for Inception and Interstellar. Tonight at 6 p.m., enjoy some lemonade and painting at Le Monet. This will be on the academic lawn. Don't be late. The Japanese Language Club is a great opportunity if you want to learn more Japanese or become more fluent. This is for all levels and it provides resources from libraries and teachers. It is also a great opportunity if you want to serve in Japan. Mm -hmm. And this is held weekly on Mondays at 5.30 p.m. in DeMoss 3285. The School of Music Commercial Music Showcase is coming up soon. And you will hear from some of our best artists on campus, both covers and originals on October 27th. You can get your tickets at liberty.edu slash tickets. Liberty Dining wants your feedback. Yes, fill out the survey on the Liberty Dining Instagram to be entered to win some amazing prizes. Including Bose headphones and a Kodak mini shot. And that's all that's new. Enjoy your day at LU. God has called you to be extraordinary. I'm referring to revision. On the contrary, it's a revival from religion. How we combat opposition, a scapegoat from contention, our vehicle used to transport us to carrying out God's vision. But look, Josh, it's evident you don't comprehend my restriction to fit in is this barrier called sin. See, Jesus doesn't seem to understand the way I live. Unthinkable things transpire that he won't forgive. I don't feel that I'm good enough to go to church, a location infused with hypocrites defining each other's worth. However, those falsified accusations are misinterpretations of Christ. The world illustrates this inaccurate portrayal of the light, but the story wasn't concluded when Jesus died. Society says he doesn't understand the way you live, yet he's the bread of life. And when you enter into a state of confession, Jesus enters into a state of intercession. He commences a court session where there's no need for guessing or unnecessary stressing. He's more than just a reverend, the bread of life more valuable than the bread of leavens because the bread of life is bread unleavened. From death, he was raised, perennial, unable to decay. He came and left and yet he's here to stay. He deserves to be praised and by him we are made, but much to his dismay, we've been led astray. 
and the insignificant distance we voyage astray reaches compensation if you simply pray because his love displayed authentic grace intended to be accepted without delay. Forget Amazon Prime. His grace is shipped in less than a day. So be his imitation and the hands and feet of Christ to all nations to attain power over temptation because God versus Satan is a three to one relation. You see, inaction is an action. When you're passive, you're passing opportunities to be vessels of compassion. And the primary thing, we all previously lack the formation of an eternal pact to serve God by the way we act, to honor Him in the manner which we live. Jesus endured a crown of thorns so we'd understand what it means to forgive. He dwelt among us. A concept so beyond our level of comprehension, His love, grace, and mercy resides in this inner dimension and His Spirit descended upon His ascension. And that's why I hate religion. Society neglects to mention that religion is partially what put Jesus on the cross, and our eternal route was rerouted in His loss. So part of the source of His crucifixion was this man-made religion comprised of rules and regulations, and those rules invoke motivation to take strides of compensation to prevent hell from being our eternal destination. But it's a system in need of reformation, a system causing eternal degradation, the right play but the wrong formation, and all the requirements need a translation. So. Jesus came as the interpretation because religion is not an adequate substitution for the relationship acquired upon Jesus' resolution. The only substitute for an eternity in hell were released from the cell because the Word became flesh and dwelled. The Word was, is, and will forever be. The only consistently persistent melody with enhanced supplication unto thee, love is present for you and me. I am a living juxtaposition of joy and tribulations. But my joy can't be confiscated by Satan. The one whose occupation is to steal, kill, and destroy is basically unemployed at the moment we allow Christ to fill the void. So at the unemployment office is where Satan sits, commandeering all the mistreated misfits. But it's easy to exit the ship. There's an efficient fix because Christ exists to assist as our transgression is dismissed. And as Christ exists, he persists that he is the way. And with one prayer, we can make that great escape and ultimately start living for Christ's sake. See, Christ isn't just a source of hope, it's the essence of who He is, an essential anecdote so commonly dismissed. And He isn't only hope, but He is also love, love unconditional, cascaded from above. His omnipresence is ever needed. In Him, all sin is defeated, all evil is retreated, because He has succeeded at making non-believers believe it. We're permitted to proceed because He preceded. He was conceived, so we can't be conceited. He's God's Son. And because the events that have transpired, we've won. Victory has already been acquired. Christ said it's done as his blood perspired. So we use these words to combat the inaccurate presuppositions that Jesus is just a figure of religion because it's not the goal of Christians to fit in and it's not the goal of the church to focus on tradition, but the goal of the church is the great commission. Over death, choose life. Over darkness, choose light. Over blindness, choose sight. Over everything, choose Christ. With unity and diversity, let the church be revived. Can you pray for us? Can you sure. pray for us? Sure, 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 sure. Drop the mic. <laughs> that, that was amazing. Welcome to Convocation. We're going to pray that God would do in us today exactly what Josh commanded us to do, inspired us to do. I'm going to ask Josh to pray that God would move today as only he can move. Please pray for us, Josh. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. God, I thank you for the great love with which you've loved us. Lord, I thank you for your passionate and personal pursuit. Thank you that you're a redeemer of all things, a restorer of all things. And as we worship now, I pray that we would behold your face. I pray, Lord, that we would exalt you, that you would be heralded and esteemed, that you would be thought of rightly and not belittled. So we thank you for calling us to yourself through yourself. 
So we worship you this morning in spirit and in truth, and we pray for breakthrough, for deliverance, for healing, that shackles would be unfastened, that chains would be loosened, that generational strongholds would be broken, and that you would help us to live and abide in attachment to abundance. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's family said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Worship with us this morning. Put your hands together. We serve a God who is worthy of all the glory and all the praise. Hey. I've got joy in the story. I've got peace in the story. I've got strength in the battle. I don't fear anymore. I'm a child of heaven in my heart. i
Told you Alabama would win the SC Championship game. Yep. Georgia will beat him in the natty. Come on. Let's go. Man. Welcome to Liberty. Thank you Great for having me. Here, man. This place is awesome. 
Man, I was sitting, I was sitting side stage, and we were singing that song, "The Goodness of God," and I thought, man, what an appropriate song as we sit down with you to talk about your story, your life, um, because in so many ways, like the valleys and the mountaintops, like so many times you have come back in, in the way that you have walked through things and shared, uh, and pointed back to, hey, in high and low, uh, the, the goodness of God. Um, your story, I can't wait to unpack it. We were having, um, we were having dinner last night, getting to know each other a little bit, and I lost count of the amount of times that we said, hey, we should talk about that. Like, tomorrow, let's make sure to, to bring that up. Um, and we want to talk about it. But before we get into your life and story, we cannot have the guy who knows as much about college football as just about anyone in the country not be here and tell us, like, what your assessment of Coach Chadwell and the 7-0 and Liberty Flames. <laughs> that's a great... That's a great starting point. And so I don't, I haven't known a bunch of coaches in college football, but Jamie Chadwell is one that I've caught up with and I've known for a while. And um, I've always tried to keep an arm's distance from coaches because of what we did on television. And you want to be able to say what you believe and not like have to protect people. But um, what the reasons you're lucky to have Jamie is Jamie's got strong faith, man. Like he's just, he's grounded, he's rooted in his faith, which is super cool. And another thing, and this is gonna sound so elementary, y'all gonna be like, you're so dumb, thank you. Why are you saying this? Jamie knows fun. Like seriously, the, the, it is an epidemic across college football. Like it's, it, listen, football, newsflash, it's really cool when you're on the field. It stinks every other time, okay? Like, able, ankles taped, knocking the crud out of each other every single day, day after day. So, man, I mean, I, he just does a good job of bringing the fun. And so y'all are lucky to have him. Um, and I think it's a perfect marriage after visiting this place and seeing what you guys are about. I'm, I have a freshman in, in high school, and, and I'm already putting the plug in for Liberty. Like, this place is and he, incredible. He plays, right? He, yeah, he plays football. Yeah. yeah. Well, if he's, yeah, we'll, we'll take him. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll, uh, um, all right, so true story. I first heard the name David Pollock um, in 2001 because um, I grew up in the South and I'm a diehard dog um, and have been for many years. Liberty Flames, um, but my roots are in the South. But anyway, so 2001, um, because as you're a little bit older than me. I was in high school. You were a freshman in college, but I was that kid who knew everyone coming on to the, the team. Um, but it was your sophomore year, 2002, where all of a sudden you break out and become one of the most recognizable faces in all of college football. Uh, you become a three-time All-American. Uh, but before you get into the spotlight where you're the guy who everyone knows your name, take us back and tell us the, the story of what God was doing in your life before anyone like on the outside knew the name David Pollock? Well, some of y'all, all y'all have different backgrounds probably in here. I, I never stepped foot in a church until I was a senior in high school. So never heard anything about it. Just where I lived, we played sports. And that's what my mom and daddy did. And I had a great mom and daddy. We just didn't talk about God. And um, so there's two things that happen. I think that's really cool to, that I would like to share is like my friend across the street, they said, hey, we're having a lock-in. I was like, what the heck's a lock-in? He's like, you basically get locked in the church and you play sports and stay up all night. I'm like, in. Like, as a kid, I just wanted to play. I was like, sold. Um, so I went to that, and then I didn't know I was gonna hear about Jesus. Um, and, and then I go fast forward to my junior year of high school, and I had a teacher named Mark Watson. And I went to a public school, and Mark was different. Like, the way he handled me, like, I'm ADD, and I was all over the place, and I was really good at getting in trouble. Like, that was a gift. That's a spiritual gift, being annoying, okay? Um, I passed it to my daughter, unfortunately. Um, but, but, like, so I, I, I would try to annoy Mark and try to get to him, and, and he had a fish sticker on his computer, and I was like, ah, Jesus freak. I was like, I know who he is. And he prayed praise and worship music in a, in a, in a, uh, in a normal school, like, not a private school, and so a public school. And, and so it was awesome. I went to, um, for outside reading my junior year, they're like, you got to pick a book to read. And I was like, I want to do the Bible. And I think a lot of it had to do with like Mr. Watson. Like I want to annoy him and get to him. And um, my English teacher was like, absolutely not. Like I can't meet with you and go over 200 pages. I was like, Mr. Watson can. And he did. I went and asked him and he agreed. And I started to read the Bible for the first time ever. And... Um, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was like, start here. I was like, and thank God he did because uh, you read Genesis as a baby Christian or just, or if you're discovering your faith, you're like, holy cow, what's going on? He, he didn't throw you into Leviticus <laughs> right off the bat? <laughs> no, no, thank goodness. Um, and, and I started to read it and I was like, wait a minute, like you've got all this history of kings and emperors and you've got a blurb like this, but, but you've got a whole book devoted to a day worker from Nazareth? Like, I'm not connecting these dots. And then we started to talk about the prophecies and the things that he came to, and my life was completely changed. And, and listen, it was because a seed was planted by somebody and then a life was lived. The way Mark Watson lived his life showed me that he had something inside him that was special. And we, we all have that opportunity, whether we're, you know, spitting scripture left and right, like we all have an opportunity to witness by the way we live. It's the most important witness we'll have. And he showed me what that looked like in the flesh. What did he teach, Mark? He, teach, he taught physics. Man. Science. That is a, uh, that's a champion for Christ, yeah. right? Like this place exists for, for people like Mark to go out and go, hey, I, I'm a physics teacher, but I'm much more than a physics teacher. And like, man. Um, all right, so you, you give your life to Christ in high school, but then you go on to the University of Georgia, um, onto the football team. Um, th it's a bit of a travesty. We don't have enough time. I had just clips, like highlights loaded up. I was just going to have you break down film, uh, but we don't have, we don't have the time. But um, you break out onto the scene your, your sophomore year. Um, you become a three-time All-American. So you go, from, you go from like baby believer to all of a sudden um, you're playing uh, college football at the highest level. Um, in the, in the public spotlight now, uh, what, what was that story like? Well, like? How did your faith hold in an environment where so many, so many people um, would, would just get the, the spotlight, the opportunity, the world would, would, just, would just take them under? Well, it was really cool because when I got to Georgia, so again, I'm not crushing my daddy. I got a great daddy, but he didn't know what a G relationship with Jesus looked like. So I go to college with Mark Rick who's a strong believer. He showed me what it looked like. I started meeting with our team chaplain with FCA. I started to memorize scripture. I started to continue to, to put it in my heart. He taught me how to start to go speak and how to really walk it out and how to live it. So that was huge for me. Listen, there's nothing you can do to prepare you for the spotlight. Like in Athens, if you play football, like it's, it's a different deal. I mean, just the way you're treated and what you have access to. But, you know, here, here's something that was really cool. And this is something for y'all that's so big. Like, like versus respected. There's a big difference. And if I'm always trying to be liked, and, and if I'm building my identity, I, there's three ways to build identity. You, you can build identity from the outside in. What, is, what does everybody say about me? And, and if you do that and you build your identity from the outside and there's gonna be a lot of this, because think about it. Some people don't like happy people. Some people don't like sad people. Some people don't like rich people. Some people don't like people. Y'all know those people. Some people just, they, they're grumpy all the time, right? They, they don't like people. Um, and then you can build your identity from the inside out. What do I say about myself? Like, what's important to me? Well, that's gonna be like this too, because the different day of the week, how we feel, I mean, uh, what happened in, in our life, what's going good. And, and then there's a reason that now the best way to build your identity is top down. What does God say about me? And, and surrounding myself with people, man, and it's to this day, by the way, like it doesn't stop in college. Like it's gonna continue to grow from college to when you get married, to when you have kids and you're doing life, like you're gonna to wanna to continue to surround yourself with people that hold you accountable, that hold you to a different standard. That's why what y'all have here is so amazing because you have so many believers and so many people pouring into you. When you go to Georgia, like it's kind of like, all right, have fun, go, go figure it out, which is a great idea, by the way, that's awesome. Like, Go figure it out as a college kid. Um, so learning how to build my identity. And once I learned how to build my identity and how to be different, it was amazing. Liked versus respected. When I went out, like I made it very clear, like I'm gonna be a virgin until I'm married. I made it very clear, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna drink alcohol. Like, and again, those looks weren't like, oh, I'm so proud of you. It was like, what's wrong with you, weirdo? Like, do you like girls? Like, I mean, yeah. and, and you're going out and they're like, hey, what is the first thing they do? Hey, drink. Hey, you wanna, you wanna drink, you wanna drink? I was like, I don't drink. And it's, and it's interesting and it's so cool that it went from that 
to, as I started to grow and get college, it was, he doesn't drink. Don't mess with my boy. Like girls, no, no, he doesn't, he doesn't like go away. He doesn't do that. You had a community around you. Yes, that, was that started to have my back. Holding you accountable, yeah. A hundred percent. And as we get older, it doesn't change. It's not gonna change at all. You, um, Mark Watson, Mark Rick, like you were saying last night, like you're, um, this is, this is just cool. Like you, you haven't played, I mean, that was back in 2002, 2003. Um, you're still in a Bible study with, with Coach Rick. Like, like what a, what a like beautiful picture of somebody who's like, no, I'm much more than a coach. Yep. Like, well, and, and so I was starting a group, a men's group a couple years ago. And I was like, Coach Rick, I'm looking for somebody that's a little bit older. Like, how did you do it? Like, how did you build a Bible study? How can I learn from people that have already screwed this up? Because just like I tell my oldest, like, I'm sorry, bro, you're the first. Some of y'all that are the first, by the way, your parents just learning with you, okay? Like, you're, they're messing it up as you go along. And I tell my son all the time, like, I'm sorry, bud, like, you're the first. And I was like, Coach Rick, I, we're just trying to find somebody that can be, you know, a Paul, and we can be the Timothy, you know? And, and he was like, I'll do it. I wasn't even asking him. Like, Coach Rick's got a lot going on, and obviously now he's got Parkinson's and so much. But... I've never seen anything like it. Like the dude goes through life and, and it doesn't matter. He's got so much peace and it's been a heart attack. It's Parkinson's. It's been, he's been fired. Like he's been through so much stuff. But I think it's so important that we find that person that's already done it. So, so you know, like I can learn from that person. Cause if y'all are like me, unfortunately, a lot of times, like I gotta get burned before I learn. But I, I think you can be truly like true wisdom. Can you learn from somebody else? Can you learn from their mistake? Because unfortunately, I'm a dodo and I just go, and it's, listen, I played defense for a reason, okay? If y'all watch defensive players, we're not the brightest, okay? Your assignment is see ball, get ball. Like offense, you got plays and like, oh, I gotta get him, I gotta get him, people are moving around. Defense, you're like, oh yeah, see that guy, we have the ball, go chase him. Um, so having somebody in, in our lives that could pour into us about parenting and how to parent and, and how, how we're going along in life, he was, he's been critical for us. And I just think about legacy, like, cause you, I mean, if you, know, uh, if you know Coach Rick's story, like Coach Bobby Bowden did that for him, yep. right? Um, and so you just think about the, the legacy of people who find themselves in these positions of influence and authority, but they don't miss like the priority and man, it's Coach Bowden's now with the Lord and who cares what happened in, you know, 1989 on, but like, think about the fact that like far bigger, like he knew, man, I'm, I'm pouring into to somebody who's gonna turn around and impact other people. I mean, that's the legacy and the, the beauty of, of the gospel. Uh, all right, so you're, you're at Georgia. You're one of the most um, recognizable faces in college football. Uh, you, you graduate, you go on to the NFL, first round uh, draft pick to the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, everybody on the outside. We had a few we Bengals, Bengals fans. fans in the house. Sweet, who day? A couple years ago, they wouldn't have clapped. Now they clap. Now they're like proud to like be representative. Um, man, your career from the outside was just, it was just constant ascent, right? Um, at Georgia, it's just like from good to great. And then everybody, every fan out there is, is watching you and just presuming, oh, he's just gonna go to the NFL and, and continue this ascent. And you go to the Bengals um, and you're, you're, and it's happening until like one moment, right? You're in a game, uh, one f uh, freak accident, you break your neck and you never play again. So you're, you're, this constant ascent all of a sudden just gets ripped away and you find yourself, um, like all your aspirations for your, your career reduced and you're in the valley. And you've said before, and I want you to unpack what you meant by it, you've said before like, it took time but I came to see like, man, that was, the, that was one of the best things that happened. Like how, how can you say that? So I told everybody since I was six years old, actually four is when I started playing football because my brother was started when he was six, he's two years older. And let me tell you, my parents were like, you tackled everything on the sidelines, like Gatorade jugs, water boys. It got weird when it was cheerleaders, but I mean, they, they got over it. Um, 
And so, like, I, I, so I told everybody, like, since I was six years old, like, hey, I'm going to play in the NFL. I'm going to play in the NFL. And I got a lot of these, like, oh, that's so cute. So does everybody else, right? Like, and, and I tell people all the time, like, don't let people define your dreams. Like, God can do amazing things through us. Like, don't let people tell you what you can and can't do. Um, no, no applause needed. Thank you, though. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, but, no, I, I get to the NFL. I accomplish my dream. This is what I've always wanted. Second year, second season, second play. Um, this is back when football, by the way, this is a long time ago. So this is when football was like really physical and you didn't get kicked out for hitting people really hard like you do now. And so like my goal going into the games was like, I really want to hit people hard and, 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 and make that a priority. And I hit the running back. Well, it's the first time I've ever hit somebody and then I couldn't move. And I went face down and it's like when you fall asleep on your pillow and you can't move your arms, and man, it freaks you out. Like it, it grabs a hold of you, it freaks you out. And then they take me and they take me underneath the, the facility and it's like, hey, you know, you fractured your C6, C7. And after they cut the pads off me and stuff, and I was like, cool, what's that, a couple weeks? And they're like, that means you broke your neck. I was like, can we stick to the fractured C6, C7? That sounds a heck of a lot better. Like, and, 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 I, and I knew, I mean, right there, jump in the ambulance, and I, I knew it, I, I knew it was probably over. Me and my wife are crying, but like God is for us. And if I learned this as, as a senior in high school and I went through college and God is for me, I know he's for me. That's what his word tells me, he's for me. In every situation, not it's always gonna be good, right? Like not only the good times, there's always something that he needs to teach us that we don't, that we don't do otherwise. And so me, I'm ADD, I'm all over the place. Well, I'm in a halo where they drill it in your skull, you know, for, for four months. And man, was it awesome. Because the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do that because I was, if I had 20 minutes, I'm working out. If I had 40 minutes, I'm playing video games. I'm going from here to here. The busyness, which is what we all do. We get in the busyness of the day and we turn the, like we, we have a busy day. We come home. What do we do? Turn the television on for more noise. And we like so much busyness. And the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And it's the first time I did it. And guess what? I started to hear from God now. I started to see him show up in my life more and more. I started to see who was in my life for the right, right reasons, like friends that start to go bye-bye. You know, um, my wife, she thought she was getting a glamorous life. Boy, was she wrong. I mean, I'm in a halo. She, she married an NFL player that could take care of her and do this, and now I'm in a halo for four months and a neck brace for four months, surgery, a neck brace for another six months. Like, she had to take care of me every day. And so those lessons I don't learn otherwise, and I'm not as good of a dad. I'm not as good as a husband. I'm not as good of a friend. Like as if I didn't struggle through that stuff and have to learn those things. So if we can remember, no matter what happens, God is for us. And we start there with every situation. Man, it's amazing. Cause, cause here's the thing. If, if you fail a class, which none of y'all do that, I'm sure. If you fail a class, what do you do? What are you doing to fail a class? You retake it, right? I don't think it's any different with our faith, with patience and anger. And like when we fail a class, if we're not gonna learn to go to God, if we're not gonna learn to seek his guidance, we're gonna take the test again. And he's gonna give you another opportunity and you're gonna take it again and take it again. And, and if, we, if we can start to go to him and real, realize we need to rely on him, then I think we start to pass some of those tests and we start to mature and grow up. And that's the only great thing, by the way. I've, I've thought of a list of things like the great things about getting old, that's it. Wisdom. Not your body, not, not the way you look. It's straight wisdom because you can't really find the other good in getting old. But how long did that take? Because, I mean, I think, like, there might be somebody in this room today who it won't, it, it's not your story. It's not, I broke my neck on a uh, football field. But it could be, hey, the life that I was heading toward has been um, irreparably changed because of an external, like maybe it's a, a death in the family, or maybe it's just uh, something that's happened, a, a diagnosis, a, a phone call, where it's, it doesn't, like, whatever I thought was before, like now life is going to be completely different. And that doesn't happen overnight, right? Um, what were the, 
what were the processes, what were the steps where you, when how long did it take to get to the place where you're able to say what you're saying today? Well, it doesn't happen overnight. And unfortunately, it's gonna continue to happen. And, and I haven't talked about this publicly at all, but like last, last Friday was another one for us. Like my best, my best friend in the world, one of my best friends in the world, his wife suddenly died. And just one day healthy, next day gone. Like we do life with them every day. They're in our small group, they're in our church. And it hurts and it stings and I don't understand it. And, but I tell you what, it's the first time I went to church last Sunday. It's the first time I went to church in 20 years where I got to church and I didn't feel like praising. You know, say like I've had so much to be thankful for and so much to be happy for, but it's the first time I didn't feel like it. And we did the praise and worship songs like y'all did here, man. And it usually gets your fire lit, right? Like, and you get so excited. But I was like, yeah, and I was just singing. And we got a cross at the bottom of, the, uh, of our church at the very bottom. It's a big, huge cross. And uh, my buddy Jeff, who just lost his wife, who, by the way, he's the greeter of our church. His wife died Friday. He's greeting on Sunday. Shook everybody's hand coming in. And he's in the back, and we go through the service, and we start talking about him. And then uh, he said, man, I don't know what it was. He said, but I had to get to that cross. And he went to the cross and two, 300 men came, put their hands on him and you could feel him. Like he was so rigid and so hard. And then man, we prayed, everybody was praying, sobbing. And, and he got up from that cross and he was relaxed and soft. And we started singing praise and worship music and he's got his hands in the air. Man, like I just, so I, I say that because it's not gonna be easy. And are you gonna have questions? Yeah. Are you gonna have doubt? Are you gonna have fear? 100%. But man, when you, when you find a church that you consistently go into, you find people that are doing life with you and you, and you look, again, look, and we're intentional with our thoughts and we're intentional with our prayers, you'll find it. You'll, you'll find it in there, but it won't, it won't be easy all the time. I mean, it's funny you mention that because, I mean, one of the things that, and you've harped on this for a while, like if you, anyone who follows you on uh, social media or listens to the podcast um, knows um, you're not afraid to talk about um, the priority of the local church. Uh, but just in you sharing that story, um, in some way it captures the heart behind it because, I mean, so often it can feel like, man, I'll, if it feels right, then I'll go belong and then I'll believe. But if it doesn't feel right and you're going, no, 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 the, the reason I go, the reason it's the habit is precisely because I don't feel like it today. Um, and that's been a value in your family for a while. And you haven't been afraid to say that uh, publicly, even as it pertains to like, sports, right? Anything like that. Um, we're getting a little bit ahead, but go ahead and like, I want you to share like where that came from. At what point did you decide, hey, there's a lot of external commitments, but I'm going to set like the priority of attendance and commitment to a local church at the highest bar. What, what are your holy habits? What are the things that are non-negotiables? So when I was a college game day and we went to Seattle and it came home, I don't care what it is, when I come home, we'll be in church. By the way, when y'all get a little bit older and you have a family, there's gonna be so much pull for sports and we gotta do this, we gotta do that. We do sports, but we show up to church in our uniform and we'll make it to the game. Like, it isn't negotiable. Like, we will be at church. But, but more, more specifically for y'all, like, I'm around so many people a lot of times, like, I wanna grow. I wanna grow, I wanna take that next step, I wanna to get to the next step. What are your habits? Show me your habits. Like show me what you're doing intentionally. What, what are the things that light your fire, man? Like what are the things, is it praise and worship? Like praise and worship lights my fire. Like praise and worship music is going in our house, it's going in our car. My kids since they were little, they've heard praise and worship music, they've heard that. They just continually heard that. Like that's gonna be a part of us. Church is gonna be a part of us. Okay. This is not too much information. Just listen to the story and I'll tell you, I'll give you more details. Every morning I get up 30 minutes before my day starts and I go right to the hot tub. 
okay? And it's not, not to soak in the hot tub. I spend 20 minutes listening to God. I spend 20 minutes every day getting still. And when I spend 20 minutes every day, and I'm, when, I, when I listen and I pray, and I ask God to come into my day, it's amazing all throughout the day where I see it. But again, what are your holy habits? What are your non-negotiables? Like, I think a lot of y'all, especially because of the school you go to, you know a lot of the word of God. Like, that is the truth. You know what, society's gonna tell you, believe your own truth. You can be what you wanna be, right? Like, you can do what you wanna do. There's one truth. Like, and if we're not spending time in that word, how are you gonna obey it? Yeah, I believe it. I believe that's the infallible word of God. Well, if it's not here, how, do you, how are you gonna obey it? How are you gonna live it? So I think it's what holy habits are the non-negotiables that we can build. Like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to that. And that way we're writing them down and we're getting those small goals and then we can hold others accountable um, for those goals and, and others that do life with us. What advice would you give to somebody who um, is beginning that holy habit? Like, like, how do you start? Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can, right? Like, and here's the thing, I will be completely honest, I'm a long time believer, okay? And when I started my hot tub routine, I, I can tell you this, I promise you, I took a phone and I wrapped it up in the towel and I was like, I'm giving myself 20 minutes and I'm not leaving. I, was, I prayed and then after like four or five minutes, I'm like, surely that's like 18 minutes, right? Like it's close. And I, and I have my phone wrapped up and I looked, I was like, seven minutes? Like, what the heck? Um, I think it's gonna feel awkward. It's gonna feel uncomfortable. Like, um, it's, a part, it's a part of your journey, but, but, but every relationship in your life, okay? And I think most of y'all believe y'all have a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God. Name me a relationship you have in your life that's important to you that you don't put time into. You got a girlfriend? You got a boyfriend? We're just not gonna talk today. That'll go over well, boys. Like, that'll go over real well. What'd you do today? I don't know. Well, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Like, I mean, like, every relationship requires intentionality. So I think start, go. Like, during this time with me, with ESPN and, and leaving, like John Maxwell said, one of the most amazing things. John Maxwell was a pastor for 25 years, one of the four most thinking guys in, in all of the country in leadership. And he told me, he was like, so what do you want to do? I was like, I don't know. And he said, uh, well, he said, I've, he said, Pollock, I've never had a clear vision in my, uh, in my time on earth. I was like, wait a minute, you're a pastor and you're, you're, spe you're speaking all over the country and do this? He said, I just keep moving forward and God clarifies it. Like, keep moving forward. If you don't know what you want to do, just keep moving forward. You know, it's funny, I think every single one of y'all in here, everybody would raise their hand to this. Like you've felt the feeling when your phone's dying and I'm gonna rush to my phone charger, right? Like all y'all been like, I ain't letting that thing die. Are you, gonna, are you willing to do that for your dreams? Are you willing to change plans and fight? Like, and not just, oh, it's just gonna die. No, like I gotta change plans sometimes, but I keep, make the next move. Like make that next step. And then I start to move forward, I start to move forward, and then I think God will crystallize things for you. You, you said last night that one thing that's really special right now is your life is your morning routine, your holy habit. You get up and you're walking in your house, heading towards the hot tub, but you pass your son who's a freshman in high school because he's going like the opposite direction to do like his own time with the Lord. Like that has been passed on to him. It looks different. Right? He doesn't do it the same way, but it's yeah. almost like you pass each other in the hallway. Like It's the coolest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. I mean, it's literally, yeah, I passed by Nicholas, who's 15, and uh, he, he journals. He reads a chapter of the Bible every day, and he journals, and he's done it for about a year now. Um, so, yeah, but it's like we get to see each other. We pass each other, and it's like, all right, you're doing it. I'm doing it. And, and again, like we got to model it, right? Yeah. Like we, more is caught than taught. Right. ever in our life, like what, whatever it is. Like, again, we can say, do this, do that, do this. Well, how are you living? Like, I, I remember becoming a Christian my senior year of high school, and, and I remember going to school, and I was like, y'all stop cursing. I rem I'll vividly remember that. And then the next minute something would happen, I'd be like, blank, blank, blank. I was like, oh, crap, what was that? Like, 
and that's how we talked in our household growing up. So like, um, obviously it just, it's, it took time, but yeah, the building those habits and seeing them come to fruition and seeing them grow, man, it's really cool. Um, so this summer, um, I mean, it's funny how God has scripted your life in a way where you have the football career and then it's ripped away from you at the, and then post that, right? Like a couple years after the, the, there's no path back to play after your injury, um, you, you end up becoming an analyst um, that is one of the most, becomes one of the most recognizable faces in uh, college football in terms of we're turning on game day and we see you, like you're breaking down games. You're at the national, cha- you're at the national championship sitting next to Nick Saban, like breaking his soul, right? Like telling him it's over, like, um, we all watched it go viral. It was just truth. Every Georgia fan was celebrating. Um, but then this summer, um, I mean, everyone, everyone on the outside, people like myself are like, oh yeah, man, like David Pollock is like, he's that guy. He's going to be like the, the, the face of college football for the next however many years. And then all of a sudden, like, boom, another moment where it's like, it's pulled away ESPN, like a, I don't know, like a bad TV show starts knocking off the good characters. Like, and all of a sudden it's like you find yourself in this other season, like where it's like, wow, I was about to, like I, it was this ascent that then all of a sudden you find yourself quickly in a valley. But you posted this video, I think it was the day it happened. Um, and I wanna watch this and then just tell me like, why that response right after that? Let's watch this video and then, and then talk to us about it. What is up, everybody? I think a lot of the news came out today, and uh, a lot of y'all heard that uh, I won't be brought back to college game day next year or to ESPN. And um, just wanted to say thank you to so many people. I, I just appreciate everybody along the journey. You know, 12, 13 years ago, ESPN taking a chance on me and all the people that I get to work with. Man, I got to work with so many great people and do so many things that was so awesome for so many years, and I'm just very, very thankful for it. And uh, I don't know what's next. I have no clue what's next in my life, but I, one thing God's shown me all along the way, man, is he is for me. He's not against me. And NFL broke my neck, career's over, fine TV. Um, you know, found coaching the last couple of years, found speaking the last couple of years. So I know God's got something amazing for me. I don't know what it's gonna be, but thank you to all my teammates and all the people that played a part in it, and uh, all you that watched and cheered me on. And um, I don't know what's next, but I know it's going to be amazing. You, you get your another dream ripped away, and you immediately respond with gratitude. That doesn't happen by accident. That's a habit. Like, talk about that. Well, I mean, I, I think it's the don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. I mean, I think there's so many things that I got to do. And there's so many things that was really, really cool that I got to see and I got to be a part of and, you know, lives around me that were there. But I mean, I think this is, this isn't a, this isn't a, another one-time thing. Like more is coming. And, and again, what does God say I am? What is my identity? Like I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been able to see this school. My, my, my friend that I told you about that his wife passed, I'd have been in Seattle, Washington all day, Friday and Saturday. Like, it's amazing when we, when, we take, when we take it and we say, this is God is for me, like we talked about, and this is, it, this is the good stuff. Now let's, take, let's watch him work and let's watch him move. And so I, I just, I didn't know what was next. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Like, but you get in life and you start to get on that bike and you start to ride, right? Like now, and y'all are in a great state for this, by the way, because now I'm like, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, like it's, it's, what do I want to spend? What is really something that, that I enjoy, that brings me joy, that I can, where can God put me that he can use me best? And I'm starting to see so many things that, that un- unfold, but again, another storm will come and something else that will come that will be hard. And, and, and unfortunately, I'm getting experience, a lot of experience with this um, as I get older, but I, I think it's a big deal with all of us and, and with our faith. What does your response look like? I mean, what does is, what is yeah. your response look like when things get tough? One of the things that's coming next for you, uh, and I wanna make sure we hit this as, as we close, uh, through your foundation, which has done a lot of great work, but you've got this thing coming up in November, uh, Banquet of Blessing. Um, share a little bit about what you're doing in November down in Georgia. Um, 
through that. This is going to be really, really cool. And my, I'm driving my wife crazy with this, by the way, because like I'm a dreamer, okay? Like I got big things and I want to go get it. Well, the problem is I'm not an executor, so she's the executor. So I'm just running 4,000 miles an hour. So we rented the Classic Center in Athens. So this comes from Luke 14, 12 through 14, and it's Jesus, not me. It's the red letters. And he says, when you throw a banquet, when you throw a feast, when you have people over, don't invite the rich. Don't invite your friends that can repay you, but invite the blind, the lame, the crippled, and then you will be blessed. So that's where it's banquet of blessings. That's where we got the name from. Um, and instead, you will be repaid at the resurrection. So we're, we're going into downtown Athens. We're right in a classic center. And picture a, uh, a bunch of tables, white tablecloth, and we're going to bus in 800 to 1,000 of the homeless in the surrounding area, and we're gonna throw a feast like it's gonna be a fee, and we're going to serve them. Cause I don't know when the last time is some of these people have been served. Like we're gonna serve them their food. We're gonna have 200 probably kids there. Like we wanna do a jumpy house. When was the last time they got to play carefree? Like do like a big jumpy house with inflatables and do those things. And then, um, and this is a dream by the way. This is the, this will be the first year and, and the dream is bigger, but to walk over to a table over there and be a brand new coat, brand new underwear, brand new socks, a backpack with a couple days of food and a hygiene kit. And you know why? Because we love you. Because you matter. Because those 200 kids that'll be there, like they didn't do anything to deserve to be there. Like some of those people there, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a couple bad decisions away from being there. Or maybe just a couple of decisions away from being caught of being there, you know? Like, um, so it's gonna be awesome. And the vision would be, having it on multiple places. Next year, having it in three or four sites. The next year, five or six, maybe go to 20 places, but serving those that, honestly, they deserve it. Yeah, man. So it hit me last night after you shared that with me. And this is me putting you on the spot, Shane, too, a little bit. Um, he probably won't like this, but I, so that November 20th falls over our uh, Thanksgiving break. Um, I don't know if this will work out or not, but if we've got some students that are going home for Thanksgiving break and live down in the Atlanta area um, that maybe wanted to come over and just volunteer and help put on the banquet of blessings, like, um, man, we might have some kids just want to come help. Come on. Like, <laughs> come on. I'm going to get with Shane and figure out what that might look like, and we'll get some information out. And if some of you are going down um, in and around that area around Thanksgiving and go, hey, I might want to uh, come on over and just roll up my sleeves and, and serve, we'll, we'll try to get that opportunity available to you. Uh, David, man, thank you so much for being here. Um, would you do me a favor? And here's what I'd love you to do. Man, would you pray? Over this room um, and over these students, um, the lives in front of them, the hardships that they might be going through now, um, man, pray for us, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Um, I thank you for this campus, for the leadership here. It's just so cool, man. And one of the things I'll say being here is I can feel you. I mean, I've been to so many campuses across the country, almost every campus in the country. And... It's not like this everywhere. And I thank you for being here. I thank you for the students, Lord. I pray that you'd strengthen them in their walks. I, I pray that they would live with a purpose and, and understand that you're for us, man. Like in every situation, you're for us and you're gonna show up and show out. And the, the body of the church isn't, isn't a building. And it's, it's these students in the room and they can find ways to serve and find ways to be a light. And the Bible says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven, that they would live in a manner and in a way that people look at him and they see Mark Watson, my science teacher, that they see a good God that's for them and that loves them. And we thank you so much for all the leadership, everybody here, the praise and worship, the band, and uh, being able to be a part of it. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we thank David for being here? Hey, we've got... We've got a couple signed footballs that David's going to toss out. Come on. Yeah, you got that. We got the dog in the front. Let's go. We got, we got to see your arm, bro.
Put it up there. Oh, whoa, whoa. The, the, the Pollock jersey, 47. Hey, heads up, guys. Hold on. I am not responsible for hitting anyone and, or any damage to the room. Boom. Give it to 47. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here. You guys have a great weekend. You're dismissed.